A very warm welcome to all our eminent speakers. I take this opportunity to introduce Dr. Ashok Khosla, our keynote speaker on this session. Dr. Khosla, our distinguished keynote speaker, has chaired and managed several positions of eminence globally and is internationally known for pioneering and contributing to sustainable development. He is currently co-chair of UNEP's International Resource Panel, UNEP-IRP. He has been president of IUCN from 2008 to 2012 and Club of Rome 2005 to 2012. His contribution in field of sustainability has been recognized with several awards such as UN Sasakawa Environmental Prize, Zayed International Environmental Prize, WWF, Duke of Edinburgh Medal, Officer of the Order of the British Empire, and Schwab Foundation Outstanding Social Entrepreneur. In 1982, he founded Development Alternatives as a major step towards fulfilling his dream for sustainable development whose efforts he continues to guide. And... Uh, Microphones? Yeah. Sorry. Right. All these mics. Um, <clears throat> General Gupta, uh, friends in INTAC, distinguished conveners, uh, it really is a great privilege for me to be here today because the one thing our country needs most is independent civil society action on many, many fronts. And I'd like to share with you a few thoughts about the need for partnerships, the need for strengthening our work through bringing together initiatives of which many, many exist in our country. We're so fortunate. India, perhaps more than any country in the world, has uh, people's movements, citizen groups, NGOs, voluntary agencies, and what better uh, in terms of example than this gathering of an army of uh, volunteers from around the country. I'd like to talk a little bit about the past, the heritage that INTAC is most deeply concerned with. Uh, I'd also like to take to talk a little bit about the predicament we're in in the present, and then a little bit of a roundup on what it means for the future of our country. How the work that we do in INTAC and in other organizations is going to transform the way we think about the future and how we will bring it about. You know, the most basic purpose of building a nation is its people, a healthy, fulfilling life for all. And a better Bharat for all, now and tomorrow, is what I think we're gathered here uh, today, and uh, hopefully every, every year, uh, in bringing all the people from around the, the country who work on these issues. You know, INTAC has been charged with safeguarding the learnings from past generations, with an army of volunteers around the country. Every nook and corner of India is covered by INTAC, and that comprehensive coverage is not only by itself something, but it works at the highest levels of quality of research, documentation, and outreach. Uh, the tangible heritage of India, the intangible issues that we uh, so dearly are so proud of in our country, our cuisines, our dresses, our um, festivals, our rituals, and, of course, the natural heritage. This is uh, fundamental, and as your motto says, uh, uh, there can't be a cultural heritage if there isn't a natural heritage. And then you do so many other things. You list um, uh, the heritage uh, uh, wealth of the country. You uh, make outreach to a lot of people about the kinds of issues that you deal with. You have training programs, you have conservation programs. And I just want to talk about a little bit about my own experience in my organization, which was set up just a few years before INTAC, in 1982, and how, as an example, uh, we can work together 
with uh, organizations that are care for, caring about uh, building a better future. Uh, the work of my organization, Development Alternatives, is about creating better options for ge future generations. We work with land and water management, with building materials, with livelihoods, with recycling, with the circularizing our economy at the most basic level of all. Our two jobs, our two clients are the poorest of the poor and the trees and the, and the natural resources of our country. Uh, but there are many other organizations uh, working on these issues, on knowledge systems, on philosophies, on faith, ethics, and tolerance, on languages. Our country is so, so rich in these intangibles. What is human happiness is something that we can only, we can define. Community, uh, and health and nutrition, yoga, these are essentially ways in which we can shape the future of our country. And these issues are also counteracted by, countervailed by, many things we've learned from the past that are no good. They're not acceptable anymore. Social hierarchies, codified exclusion, greed and intolerance, violence, cruelty. You know, we love to say that we are a peaceful nation, nonviolent. But I have never, been, I have worked in 110 countries when I was in the UN, and I've never been to a country that is more cruel to animals than, than ours. So we have to now also recognize that not everything about our past culture is perfect, and that we also have to examine and re-examine how we live and what we do and what we profess, and some of the hypocrisies that we have. And there are many organizations in our country that deal with these gross economic disparities, the extreme wealth and the extreme deprivation that coexists in our country, over-exploitation of resources, waste, pollution. These are all things that also we have to deal with. They're negatives, and we've got to figure out ways in which to overcome them. You see, the world is changing, and India is changing even more than the world rapidly. We're going from an empty world where there was a lot of space and resources and a few people to a grossly full world. We're going from a highly unequal world to a grossly unfair world. We have abundancy of resources, and now we're facing huge scarcities. And of course, you know, we have for thousands of years had a population that didn't expect anything. And now everybody expects a lot, especially in terms of human rights. But we do have solutions. We've got good science and knowledge. We've got technology and innovations. And we can design new institutions, new social uh, type forms of, of uh, getting our act together. And there are so many of us. There's uh, in Delhi, in Lodi Estate, you can imagine how many of our organizations are so well endowed with caring, with commitment, with a cause that we need to take forward. And my plea today, this morning, is that we can't any longer work in isolated uh, silos. We have to figure out ways in which, on a daily basis, we work together. None of us can do all that is needed alone. We have to find complementarities, partnerships, and be able to work together. And I give you just a few examples of this amazing resource. Every one of these, by the way, is within a kilometer. One kilometer, except for mine, which is four kilometers, of your headquarters in Delhi. Every one of these is a walking distance, and we don't even talk to each other. So it's very, very important that when conveners like you work around the country on your cultural heritage in a specific place, it might be paintings, it might be dance, it may be monuments, but we also have to think about the other things. And there are government and non-governmental organizations. There's the Pariyavaran Bhavan. There's also the ministries of uh, earth sciences, all literally within a stone's throw of your uh, headquarters. So let me talk a little bit about the present. The present, the predicament we're in. You see, we, it's a truism. Everybody knows that we are two countries living in one place at the same time. There's Bharat and there's India. India is pretty fortunate. People in India live, 500 million of us, as well as people in Europe and North America. And they're very, very happily going along, 
not noticing that there's another 900 million living in Bharat at the same place at the same time. And there seems to be only one kind of relationship between them, an exploitative one. Two different nations in one place, one time. And the paradox of privilege and plenty on the one hand and poverty and pollution on the other is too much for any of us to bear. That's why we're here. So we must ask ourselves, this country is developing rapidly. We're proud to say that in 30 years time, we will be 30% of the world's economy. This is all nonsense. This is where we're going. Some of us live like this, runaway consumers, travel, mobility, uh, connectedness. We're actually so privileged that even the pharaohs, the maharajas of old didn't live as well as any one of us. Didn't have the opportunities and the options for good life that every single one of us in this room has. This is a picture of a, a family in Ujjain, the Patkars, way back in 2005, 17 years ago. And the food for one week was put on their table and they spent at that time 1,600 rupees per week. And you can see they were pretty well off and it's a good, it's a good life, good middle class life. But look at our income distribution. The income of our country is now not 2080, it's 199. There are 10 billionaires in India who own as much as half the population of this country. Is that what we were created for in 1947? Was that the dream of our founding fathers? And the others, Bharat, is in a vicious cycle, in a permanent trap of poverty. Poverty, no markets, resource destruction, no income, small, bigger families, more children, more uh, work, but no less, less income. And it goes into a wider, wider vicious cycle. This is a picture we took some time back in an area that I work in, Bundelkhand. Bundelkhand is proverbially one of the poorest parts of India. Fragile ecosystems, fragile economy. And this woman, you know, I look at her, she's got her, her, not just all her possessions in this picture, she's got her whole world in this picture. And when, every time I see this picture, I say, how many Lata Mangeshkars, how many Marie Curies have we lo lost? How many are we losing every year? Because they have no choice, they have no options, they have no opportunities. Every one of these little children could become a leader in our country, helping build a nation, and that's how they live exist, die. My heart goes out to that woman. She has no hope of any kind except having more babies. You know, there are 300 million people, maybe more now, uh, who don't have clean drinking water in our country. This is the Kumars of Tikamgar, of Bundelkhand. A few years ago, four or five years ago, I took a picture of them. That's the entire food they have for their family. One, two, three, four, five, six people living on 200 odd rupees a week. And what happens? They've destroyed their environment and their resources and their, the, the food production capability and the water systems of their land. And they have no choice but to end up in Gurgaon or in Kanpur as daily laborers. And this is a picture I hang in my office so that every one of my colleagues can see this every day. She and her two brothers, you can hardly see this little one in her lap, is simply asking, how can I help build a nation? If that doesn't strike a conscience in any, any, each one of us, then I don't know whatever will. Today's vision of development is violence. Violence against people, violence against nature, and violence against cultures. That's what we consider development. And what does it lead to? It leads to climate change, floods, droughts. You know, almost a billion people live under extreme dry conditions. Our deserts in India, according to UNEP, are growing at the rate of 10,000 square kilometers per year. That picture is 
of a place also in Bundelkhand in Datya. The Maharaja of Datya in 1935 wrote in his diary, went out looking for tigers. This was a thick teak and bamboo forest. And he took his guests, the Duke and Duchess of some place or other, to hunt tigers. Came back, he said the forest was so thick we couldn't get in. That's what it looks like today. Forest fires, species extinction, we're in trouble. And when I say predicament, I mean really a major predicament. None of us really gives much thought to. Every day when you wake up, those are the issues that we have to recognize our children are going to be living with. So what is this heritage that we are all thinking about going to mean for our legacy for the future? Let me just start with looking at what kind of a future we want. We want a, a country in which our citizens are healthy and fulfilled, leading decent lives. One, a country where people count, people of all kinds, poor, rich, middle class, whoever they may be, they count in our policies, in our actions. All people. The economy counts, our natural resources, our manufacturing, our services, trade, investments. People's behavior counts. I'm very proud of this slide because I invented this logo and I've been trying to sell it to everybody. I got the NID, National Institute of Design, to help me design the logo. But it basically says, Lena, Dena. Lena, Dena. It is now time for us to call corruption to an end. I fear it's worse today than it has ever been since 1947. I face it every day. I know that it has not gone. And I believe that it's the job of every single one of us to say no from now on. Jobs. Jobs are what count perhaps the second most. Jobs of all kinds. Jobs for poor people, jobs for rich people, we call them livelihoods for poor, and we call them jobs for the rich. But basically, a decent, well-paid, dignified work is essential for everyone. And above, above all this, the nation's assets, nature and life supports. Our forests, our rivers, our wetlands, our lands and soils, our built environment and infrastructure, and of course, who knows better than you all here in this room, our culture and heritage. These are infinitely wealthy, create infinite wealth for our country, and we mustn't lose them. Unfortunately, we've lost a lot of them already. So we must now work to nurture all kinds of capital, human capital, physical capital, financial capital, but most important, natural capital. So what then are the alternatives? How, we do the, how do we do this? How do we create an India that is prosperous for everyone, inclusive, sustainable, resilient, and hopefully regenerative? How do we change the nation's course so that we become good ancestors for future generations as our ancestors were for, for us? After all, we have so much to be thankful for our seeds, our clothes, our way of living, our thoughts, our philosophies, all inherited from great ancestors of the past. And we have a responsibility to make sure the future is got the same. So we must now design new kinds of decision systems for a better future. A new politics that values rights, human rights of everyone, fairness and justice, diversity. We must examine ourselves and ask, do we have that at the moment? Are we working towards that? Is it really where we are headed? A new economics that values equity, social justice, as well as efficiency. It values the future as much as it values the present. And it's systemic, nonlinear. It understands that things can suddenly become bad and our economics can't handle that. And we need to expand our decision time horizons. You know, an active uh, business person 
thinks in terms of the next quarter. An active uh, politician might think in terms of the term of office, maybe five years. Today, things have got so bad that, you know, apart from the laborer who can't think from more than one paycheck to the neck, next, one month or so, uh, our speculators deal with microseconds. Our speculators are making money buying and selling stocks at the level of one millionth of a second. And that's why we're in such deep trouble. We now need to think even beyond foresters and engineers of one generation. We've got to think about our descendants in American, Native American Indian cultures, they talk about seven generations. Well, let's at least have five. I mean, we've got to think not only of our children, but we've got to think way ahead when we build a dam, whether we plant a forest or a tree, we've got to think ahead. What are the consequences? The Green Revolution in the Punjab was one of the most amazing contributions of science to humanity. Probably in the history of the world, there were very, very few such amazing saviors as this. And now, today, 40 years later, we know that it has not only saved the country from starvation, it's also created an enormous number of ills of various kinds, which need not have happened had we thought ahead, had we allowed for the fact that you can have your cake and eat it also. So our job now is to become good ancestors, and I'm running out of time, so let me move forward. Creating new institutions for a better future means smaller, local, decentralized approach to life. Local self-reliance, community-based uh, organizations, which empower particularly women and bring, bring their, their, their thoughts and their aspirations and their dreams into the decision-making. And we need institutions for foresight, for alternatives, for long-term thinking, for minimizing unintended consequences like in the Punjab. We need institutions that are human scale, that you can go to and say, this is what society is doing to me, that woman in Bundel can should be able to change her life completely by being able to go to one window and saying, I have this to offer, please help me. And then there's innovation and action, frugal use of resources, compatibility with nature, and aimed at human well-being. And most important of all are the values that our nation spouses. You know, Lord Buddha already 2,500 years ago said, we all share this world. We have to learn to live in harmony and peace with each other and with nature. Hippocrates, 2,000 years ago, said, above all, do no harm. Every doctor has to, to swear this oath. But today, I think all of us, not just doctors, but, but professionals, ordinary human beings, citizens, should be swearing a new oath Above all, do the greatest good. St. Francis of Assisi, don't hurt anyone. And our own Mahatma, not so long ago, said, the earth, the air, the land, and water are not our inheritance from our forefathers, but on loan from our children. The earth provides enough for everyone's need, but not for even one person's greed. So we need now to go back to our eternal values. Satya and Ahimsa, Sarvadeya and Antodeya, Swadeshi, secularism, and of course, sufficiency. We need not just rights, but we need responsibilities. So we come to the conclusion that our country needs healthy Indians and healthy India, which needs a healthy planet, and which needs healthy communities. And we all have to do that. And you as conveners are in probably the best position to expand your, your domains of thinking so that we're not just taking a few photographs and documenting them. We are using that for making a better future. What is the moral of the story? Over and above all, India needs a longer vision for the future and a stronger respect for civil society. In other words, please be the ancestor that your children and their children will be proud of. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kosla, Dr. Kosla.
uh, I think we need to be reminded of what you've said all the time because we normally tend to forget. We have heard you, and we, but we might go out and just forget everything. So uh, what we need to do is to keep reminding ourselves that this is something that needs to be done. 